St. Petersburg, 1905. Russian workers are up in arms. Factories are closing every day. Calls for the removal of the Tsar are becoming more and more strident. The passive and out-of-touch emperor, Tsar Nicholas II, was under serious threat. Reluctantly, he had agreed to sign an order which limited his powers and created a parliament, the Duma. How shameful it is to live through such a crisis in the eyes of the whole world. But this is God's will, and I must endure all troubles until the very end. 300 years of absolutist rule were over, but the conflict between Tsarist Russia and her growing legions of radicals was not. As desperate as the political situation was, the Tsar and his Empress Alexandra remained absorbed in their own family life and the past glories of the Romanovs. And as the tides of history swelled into a tidal wave, they found themselves right in its course, struggling to remain afloat. It was in 1904, after having four charming daughters, that the Emperor and Empress of Russia were blessed with a male heir. Nicholas II was determined that his son would be better prepared for the Tsar's mantle than he had been. From an early age, Alexei was introduced to public life and expected to take part in official occasions. He was the living proof of the regeneration of the Romanov dynasty, an inspiration to an entire generation. We were learning French using the same textbook as the youngest Romanov. And on the second page, there was his picture. For us, it was even an incentive at that time that the heir to the throne used the same textbook as us. How could we fail to do well? Of course, we all spoke wonderful French. The heir was usually dressed in a sailor suit, and I also wore a similar sailor suit. We were the same age, and I would always compare my soul with him. It was the fashion for boys to be dressed in the same way as the heir. But Alexei's innocent beauty concealed an awful truth. He had been born with an incurable illness. The boy was a hemophiliac and was unlikely in those days to reach adulthood. Hemophilia, a hereditary disease, was passed through the mother. This had a devastating effect on the Empress Alexandra. When the child was born with that illness, which was obviously inherited from her, from the mother, who, who awaited the birth of an heir, finally. The boy was born, and he had hemophilia. That destroyed her. Nature gave four daughters to the Tsar, as if it meant to tell him, be careful, don't, don't, don't. From that moment on, she lived only to ensure that the boy would survive and would reign one day. 
Nicholas and Alexandra's desperate concern for their son's well-being was to dominate their thoughts and shape their destiny. The first clue that a savior for the little boy might have come can be found in Nicholas's diary. November the 1st, 1905. We have got to know a man of God, Gregory, from Tobolsk province. When Gregory Rasputin arrived in St. Petersburg, his reputation as a mystical faith healer had preceded him. The Tsar and the Empress were intrigued by this man, and my grandmother introduced Rasputin to the Tsar. The grandmother and her sister realized that this man was a typical Russian-style healer. They thought it could be useful or interesting for the Tsar and the Empress to know him, but they never thought it would go that far and it would become an exclusive relationship. For Nicholas and Alexandra, Rasputin symbolized the simple soul of the Staryts, the holy man of Russian folk tradition. They believed that God had at last answered their prayers. Rasputin was to worm his way into the hearts of the imperial family. From an early age, Alexandra had wanted her son to lead as normal a life as possible. A sailor named Darabenko was assigned to protect the fragile Alexei. He was the young boy's constant companion, but by necessity he was also something of a warden. My mother, as a child in the Crimea, used to play with the children of the emperor. She was three years older than the young Tsarevich, whom she remembers as a very spunky, energetic little boy who wanted to do all sorts of things that he was prevented from doing because they were so afraid that he would fall and, and again get sick from hemophilia. So uh, the sailor who took care of him had a terrible time. It was a constant struggle to provide Alexei with a normal, happy childhood and still keep him alive. At the Imperial Palace of Livadia in the Crimea, the Empress organized family and friends into helping with her charity bazaars in the nearby resort of Yalta. Both the Emperor and the Tsarevich Alexei were expected to do their bit to help Alexandra. There were round white markets with stoves. And literally two steps away from me was air. He turned out to be a very jolly boy, a very mischievous boy. He was pulling prizes out of large sacks filled with oats and presenting them to the winners. He thrust his hand inside and cried, Oh, I can't find anything, I can't find anything searching for a gift. But of course they were filled with gifts. And then he said, oh, this one's heavy, so heavy, I can't lift it. He wanted to tease an elderly gentleman standing there. And then he pulled out a bottle of champagne. As Alexei grew up, severe bruising and hemorrhaging continued to appear without warning often threatening his life. The doctors were at a loss. In May of 1905, Gregory Rasputin arrived at Alexei's bedside and uttered a few soothing words. To everyone's amazement, bleeding in the suffering young Tsarevich stopped. To the Empress, it was a miracle. She was blind to Rasputin's public image of depravity and deceit. 
My father saw him rush out onto the sort of balcony and draw attention to himself in no uncertain terms. And then he attempted, I don't know whether he was taken away by then, to um, show his vital parts. And it's reputed to have said, this what rules Russia. And that's it. As Rasputin elbowed his way up the social ladder, photographs found their way into the newspapers with captions full of suggestive innuendo, romancing the Romanovs, in the family circle. Throughout St. Petersburg, Rasputin quickly became notorious, though in truth, he did not spend much time in the imperial household. He was often thousands of miles away in his native Siberian village of Pokrovskaya with his wife and three children. And while Rasputin lingered in his homeland, his enemies in the capital were compiling sexually compromising pictures of him. The pictures found their way to the chairman of the new parliament, or Duma, Rodzianko. Horrified, he requested an audience with Tsar Nicholas. I showed him the photographs, and I said, and what if something were to happen to the heir to the throne? I implore you, my sovereign, banish this dirty interloper from the court. The Tsar was silent, and then said, no. I cannot promise you that. My grandfather didn't like Rasputin at all. He knew all about him. He studied his life. He had means to study. And he considered him as the evil spirit. Of course, Rasputin was an imposter, a tragic figure. He never was a monk, but he sometimes pretended to be one. No matter how grotesque the evidence, the Tsar could not take from his wife her one hope for Alexei's survival. Alexandra was becoming increasingly hysterical and paid little attention to public opinion. Fear for her son's life made the Empress turn ever more to God. In August 1912, the new cathedral built at Alexandra's instigation near the family home in Tsarskaya Selo, the Tsar's village, was ceremoniously opened. It was named the Fyodorovsky Cathedral, and it was here that she spent many hours in silent prayer for her son. The cathedral still stands an empty shell to the memory of Alexandra Fyodorovna's faith. The imperial couple hid their fears about the heir in a public display of official engagements. Outside their closest circles, the nature of Alexei's illness was not known. The strain of keeping up appearances took its toll on Nicholas and Alexandra. Whenever they could, they took pleasure in normal family life, far away from the formalities of the court. Even when he wore the black armband of court mourning, Nicholas loved horsing around when off duty. The Tsar loved photography and took pictures of his adored family at every opportunity. Surviving 70 years of Bolshevik rule, thousands of these photographs are today held in the Moscow archives. 
It's not for nothing that Nicholas's contemporaries said that had Nicholas II not been Tsar, he would have made a wonderful photographer. Every evening, and for Nicholas this was the most pleasant part of his day, he would stick these photos in, sign them, sort through them, and the whole family would join in. In the fall of 1912, the imperial family gathered at Spala, a hunting retreat in Poland. It was a place meant for enjoying outdoor pursuits, and all the family participated, except for Alexei. He had to be content with gentle boat trips on a nearby lake. One day, while climbing into the boat, he tripped and fell. Terrible hemorrhage appeared on Alexei's thigh and groin. The seven-year-old was in agony, his strength seeping from his body. The doctors who rushed in from St. Petersburg pronounced the case hopeless. Rasputin was far away in Siberia. Pierre Gilliard, the children's tutor, was in the dark about Alexei's malady, which was a closely guarded secret. But he knew something was terribly wrong. I found myself in the corridor opposite Alexei's room, from which a moaning sound came distinctly to my ears. Suddenly I noticed that Serena running towards me. There was a terror-stricken and distracted look on her face. Nicholas, as so often in moments of despair, wrote to his mother. The days between October the 6th and the 10th were the worst. The poor darling suffered intensely. The pains came in spasms and recurred every quarter of an hour. I was hardly able to stay in the room, but of course had to take turns with Alex, for she was exhausted by spending whole nights by his bed. For the first time since Alexei's birth, public bulletins were issued admitting that the heir to the throne was seriously ill. Desperate, the Empress gave instructions for a telegram to be wired to Rasputin. His reply came by return from Siberia. God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve. The little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him too much. Within a day of the telegram's arrival, the hemorrhage stopped. For the Empress, it was simple. A miracle had been worked. Spala was to prove a dramatic turning point. From now on, Rasputin's power over the Empress was to grow unchecked. In February 1913, despite the now limited powers of the Tsar, the Romanovs were grandly celebrating 300 years of their dynasty. They made a pilgrimage through the empire, arriving in Moscow in May. There was an appeal to welcome the Tsar. So I went along, climbed up onto a tree, and saw the Tsar and Serena with their cavalry escort riding through Moscow. The Tsar and Serena were bowing to the people.
It was all white, light and gold. The procession was headed by the Tsar and Tsarina. And I was rather surprised because the Tsarina looked so much more imposing, bigger somehow than the Tsar. Despite all the splendor, the Romanov dynasty was troubled. Public discontent bubbled beneath the surface, and now a new weakness appeared in the royal family. Newsreels had come into vogue, and in them, the young Alexei could be seen obviously ill and being carried everywhere. The invincible Romanovs were vulnerable after all. In the summer of 1914, the family set off on their annual cruise on the imperial yacht Standard. It was a relatively carefree summer. As the Romanovs danced away the northern white nights, they seemed blissfully unaware that their whole world was about to be swept away, first by world war and then by revolution. On the 28th of June, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated in Sarajevo by Serbian nationalists. The Germany of Kaiser William II saw in this the opportunity it had been seeking to expand its empire. When the Austrians appealed for support in a retaliation against Serbia, Germany agreed. The Germans anticipated that the Russian Tsar might well come to the assistance of his Slav brothers, the Serbs. This would give Germany the pretext it needed to declare war on Russia. But the Kaiser was the first cousin of the German-born Russian Empress, Alexandra. In the close-knit world of European royalty, Willy, as he was known in the family, was also a distant cousin of Nicholas. Nicholas II couldn't believe in 1914 that a European war was going to break out, couldn't really believe it in his heart. And I think that had something to do with the fact that he'd known William II since they were children. William had sat in the next door room when Nicholas and Alexandra were engaged. William had fallen in love with Alexandra as a, as a young man. Very hard to believe that your, your cousin Willie is actually going to start a, a war which is going to turn Europe upside down. But blood counted for little when empires were on the march. Willie and Nicky were soon to find themselves on opposite sides of the divide. And the Russian people would come to see their Tsar's beloved Empress as an interloper, a German spy, and the source of all the country's misfortunes. News of Germany's declaration of war on Russia reached Nicholas at home in the Alexander Palace in Tsarskoye Selo. Alexandra began to weep as her confidant, Isa Buxhoveden, remembered. She was the Empress of Russia, Russian always in heart and soul. Once during the war she said to me, it is the country of my husband and my son. I love this country with all my heart. Word 
word of the war spread like wildfire. Russia appeared to rally to the cause, and even to her czar. When the czar arrived, we all made for Winter Palace Square. We were curious to see him and hear what he would say. People were carrying the Tsar's portrait and crosses. Reserve soldiers took their uniforms out of mothballs, put them on and were singing God Save the Tsar. This was our official anthem. We were playing the balcony. We went out onto the balcony, which was higher than the balcony of the emperor, and we saw him come out, and everyone on the square in front of us, everyone, got down on their knees and sang, God save the Tsar. At this point, a telegram arrived from Rasputin in Siberia. Let Papa not plan for war, for with war will come the end of Russia and yourselves. You will lose to the last man. The Tsar read it, tore it into shreds, and gave the order for general mobilization. People brought icons and placed them by the wheels. People were crying. And we young people were thinking that we haven't seen anything of life yet, and now we will die. Each time someone was called up, everyone would get together. They'd comfort one another, and everyone would see the recruits off. They'd be drinking and music. People were playing harmonicas and accordions. Though support for the war may have seemed strong, the last Russian defeat in 1904 had resulted in the country's first brush with revolution. As a precaution, the Tsar's secret police, the Okhrana, made it their job to neutralize those who did not support the war by exiling them to Siberia. The revolutionary members of the Duma stood clearly against the war. They staged a walkout and were promptly charged with treason and imprisoned. Meanwhile, the modern and well-equipped German army was feeling lucky. Paris for lunch and St. Petersburg for dinner was the confident Kaiser's cry. The Tsar's army was larger than the Germans, the biggest in the world, in fact. But it was not as well-equipped or as well-led. Nicholas appointed his uncle, Grand Duke Nikolai, commander-in-chief of the army. Nikolasha, as he was known, was the obvious choice. His physical stature alone set him apart as a natural leader of men. The emperor was the shortest man of, of the whole extended Romana family. Unfortunately, he inherited his mother's genes instead of his father's. And all the grand dukes were from six foot two to six foot six, and he was something like five foot seven. My grandmother was his first cousin. Told me once that he told her, who wants to take orders from a dwarf?
But whatever personal doubts or insecurities haunted Nicholas, the Tsar was God's anointed and he did his duty, traveling the front lines and boosting his soldiers' morale. The capital, St. Petersburg, was renamed Petrograd in a spirit of Slavic unity. News from the front began to drift in. A Russian victory against the Austrians was offset by crushing losses at the hands of the Germans. And, as always, war brought misery, fear, and tragedy. The attack was a nightmare. We were supposed to march in ranks. Our rank was scattered. Behind me was another rank, five ranks in all. And the Germans had the same. It was us against them. If I don't kill him, he'll kill me. And the horses just kept going, unconcerned whether you are on your feet or have fallen to the ground, and the cavalry with their sabers slicing to the left and to the right. And then we poor infantry had to clear it all away. Some were without heads, some without arms, some just wounded. The war roused the fervor of the already patriotic empress. She put on a nurse's uniform, and her two eldest daughters, Olga and Tatiana, followed suit. Alexandra supervised the establishment of 85 hospitals in the Petrograd area alone. Even the ground floor of the Winter Palace was given over to hospital beds. The well-meaning Empress and her daughters struggled to do their part, caring for patients. I know that the wounded soldiers did not like that, because they were still unskilled nurses. And after their departure, it was often necessary to change the bandages, and this was a painful procedure. The suffering she saw made a deep impression on Alexandra, as she wrote to her husband after attending to a soldier with a shattered groin. Scarcely a man any more, so shot to pieces. Perhaps it must be cut off as so black but hope to save it. Terrible to look at. I won't describe any more details, as it's so sad. But being a wife and mother, I feel for them quite particularly. Alexandra wrote daily reams to her husband at the front. In our archives, her letters alone number over 600 and two-thirds of them were written in the years of the First World War. She sometimes wrote two or three letters a day. Nikki and Alex wrote to each other in English, their best common language, in a style all of their own, frozen in time. My own sweet Nikki love, may God help me to repay you hundredfold for all your sweetness. Yes, verily. I doubt there being many such happy wives as I am. My beloved Sonny, when I read your letters, my eyes are moist. It seems that you are lying on your sofa and that I am listening to you, sitting in my armchair by the lamp. I don't know if I could have endured it all if God had not decreed to give you to me as a wife and friend. I kiss you and the children tenderly. Ever your old hubby, Nicky.
In March 1915, the Russian army captured a key fort at Peramyshal, Poland. But their joy was short-lived. From now until the summer, they were to suffer defeat after defeat. That summer of 1915, Nicky had his hands full at the front. And so his wife began to try to lighten his load by helping with the affairs of state in the capital. That help eventually included conferring with Rasputin over political appointments. One of their joint decisions was to target the head of the army, Nicholas's uncle, the Grand Duke Nikolasha. Please, my angel, I have absolutely no faith in Nikolasha. I am haunted by our friend's wish and know it will be fatal for us and for the country if not fulfilled. You know Nikolasha's hatred for Gregory is intense. Nobody knows who is emperor now. It is as though Nikolasha settles all, makes the choices and changes. At the end of August 1915, Nicholas summoned his council of ministers and told them he was going to replace Nikolai. If the Tsar would have replaced Uncle Nikolasha, that would have been absolutely normal. The mistake was of taking up himself the high command. But his idea was a mystical idea. He felt he was a sacrificial victim of the lamb sacrificed on the altar to the god, to the god of war. He wanted to take part in the tragedy of the Russian soldiers. My own beloved, darling Sonny. Thank God it's all over, and here I am with this new heavy responsibility on my shoulders. Fancy my wifey helping Huzzy when away. What a pity you did not perform that duty long ago. It was an extremely deep relationship, husband and wife. A, a deep physical bond, you know, it's very strange. They were, they were lovers, really. And as a consequence, he had total confidence in her judgment, in her wisdom. But the poor woman was deluded. My very own beloved one, you have fought this great fight for your country and throne, alone and with bravery and decision. It is the beginning of the great glory of your reign. Our friend said so, and I absolutely believe it. I am near and with you forever and ever, and none shall separate us. Your very own wife, Sunny. In Nicholas's absence, power in the capital moved more and more into the hands of the Empress. And with the passing months, the shadow over the Russian state grew longer and longer. The Russian army's headquarters had now moved to safer ground at Mogilyov, not far from Moscow. The Tsarevich Alexei now joined Nicholas there, who wrote reassuringly to Alexandra. It is very cozy sleeping side by side. I say prayers with him every night and read your letters aloud to him. He kisses your signature. His company brings light and life to all of us here. The Tsar had arranged for Alexei to continue his studies. His tutor, Gilliard, was there to teach French and to take a few snowballs. The Tsarevich, obviously in high spirits, was in a giddy mood when he found he had been caught on camera. Then, after months of relative good health, he suffered a severe nosebleed in December of 1915. He was hastily sent back to St. Petersburg, 
where he once more came under the care of Rasputin. The Staritz was now living in an apartment at number 64 Gorokovaya Street in the capital, and the legends about him continued to grow. In early winter, my husband and I were walking arm in arm along Gorokhovaya Street, when suddenly I realized I was not feeling well. I was losing consciousness, and I fainted in the snow. My husband got a fright and said, what's the matter? What's wrong with you? He turned round and his eyes met the green eyes of a mujik, a peasant with a big bushy beard. My husband guessed who it was immediately, Rasputin. His sexual passion was so strong that he could make you lose consciousness even when he was behind you. Rasputin was always careful to appear devout and servile with the Empress, leading her to believe that all rumors of debauchery were just that, rumors. Feeling the power of imperial protection, Rasputin now tried to influence government appointments across the board. People like my grandfather at the time when he was governor of Petersburg uh, used to receive little notes, short notes, uh, from Rasputin. All his notes always started in the same way, dear friend, they always said, please appoint so-and-so to, to whatever Rasputin thought. Governor Zinoviev threw them into the trash. In fact, it is doubtful that Rasputin's little notes had much impact on ministerial appointments at all. What is truly important about Rasputin is not what the man did, but what he was perceived to have done or be doing by Russian society. And it's how he was perceived and the way that that destroyed the prestige of the dynasty that is really important in the history of the Russian Revolution. If Rasputin was damaging the Tsar's name in the capital, the war was testing his subjects' loyalty throughout the rest of the empire. Wounded soldiers, recuperating far from their families, were torn by the letters that started to arrive from home. As a boy, Kolya Izachek read such letters aloud to soldiers billeted in his school. They were writing that, for example, Ivan had also been drafted, that one of them had had to sell their cow, that the horse couldn't work anymore, that there were no men left in the village. All had been driven away to this carnage. And that we, women, are sowing and gathering in the harvest and doing the work of horses. Life had become very hard. There were no supplies left, no cotton or cloth, barely any kerosene. The Tsar, the little father, tried to keep morale at the front high. His own morale was far from high as news from Petrograd of strikes and shortages filtered through. And to those who saw their czar at this time, his face betrayed his sense of isolation. When he raised his hand in greeting to us, in his face was, I can't describe it, I saw such a look of terrible despair as though he were asking us. What shall I do? Often, when I was in church, I found that some icons would remind me of the Tsar.
such a look of resignation in his face. And even now, I can see him before my eyes. That winter of 1916, the whole family were again reunited with Nicholas at headquarters at the front. In December 1916, Rasputin wrote to the Tsar, I feel that I shall leave life before January the 1st. Tsar of the land of Russia, if you hear the sound of the bell which will tell you that Gregory has been killed, you must know this. If it was your relations who have wrought my death, then no one in your family, that is to say none of your children or relations, will remain alive for more than two years. They will be killed by the Russian people. Gregory. In Petrograd, Rasputin's supposed political influence was grist to the mill of the Tsar's enemies. And in the Duma, one member finally had the courage to say what others were thinking. Vladimir Purishkevich was a prominent monarchist. The Tsarist ministers are puppets whose strings are held tightly in the hands of Gregory Rasputin, that evil genius of Russia and the Tsar and the Empress Alexandra, a German woman who's been left on the throne. The Tsar's reluctance to rid himself in Russia of this corrupt man is pushing Russia into an abyss from which there will be no way back. Those closest to the Tsar felt it was now time to act. The Tsar's first cousin, Grand Duke Dmitri, was to take up the challenge. If Nicholas would not put an end to Rasputin's influence, then he would. The plan was to be masterminded by Prince Felix Yusupov. Married to the Tsar's niece, he was one of the richest men in Russia and known for his flamboyant behavior. A more unlikely assassin would have been hard to find. Prince Yusupov now enrolled the support of Purushkevich, who was to supply the murder weapon. Grand Duke Dmitri, something of a socialite, determined the time of the plan's execution. His first free evening wasn't until the 16th of December. The date was set. Rasputin was invited to the Yusupov Palace for midnight and led down to the cellar. Whatever happened that night has been obscured by time and imagination. The story goes that his hosts poisoned him with cyanide, shot him three times at point-blank range, and beat and kicked him. Still, he pulsed with life. The astonished assassins dragged him outside to the icy river Neva and threw him in. The waters closed over his body, and all was still. At the Alexander Palace, the Tsarina was frantic upon hearing the dire rumors about Rasputin. She wrote to Nikki. You can imagine our feelings, thoughts. Our friend has disappeared. I cannot and won't believe that he has been killed. God have mercy. Three days later, one of a pair of galoshes belonging to Rasputin was found on the Petrovsky Bridge. The police began to search the river and soon made a grisly discovery. The autopsy report, discovered years later, reported no traces of poison in the body and no water in the lungs. Whatever the cause of death, the mad monk was no more. Alexandra was inconsolable. 
It was her wish that Rasputin be buried in the gardens of the Alexander Palace, where she could take courage from his spiritual presence. Nicholas returned from the front to comfort his grief-stricken wife, who was by now despised by her subjects and bereft of her source of hope. For Nicholas, it was one step closer to the abyss. Tsar of the land of Russia, you must know this. If it was your relations who have wrought my death, then no one of your family will remain alive for more than two years. They will be killed by the Russian people. Gregory. <laughs> 